Okay, thank you. That's you. That's you. Bye. Yep. Yeah. So thank you very much for being here, and you're welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you. Wait, so where do I put my microphone so you hear me? Do you hear me okay? Like this? Good. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about Gibbons today. Um, and yeah, my name is Felix. I'm co-founder uh, uh, of a company called Broken Rules. Um, and I'm also game director there. We are a small independent game studio based in Vienna, close to Budapest. Um, uh, and we've been around since 2009. We've been making games since 2007. Uh, and this is our fifth game that I'm talking about. Well, I'll talk about a few other games as well, but mostly about Given Beyond the Trees. Um, it came out in February, this February, on Apple Arcade, uh, Steam, Itch.io, and Nintendo Switch. Um, we call it an ecological adventure. It's about the beauty of wilderness and the destructive force <coughs> of human civilization. Um, and in it, um, so you hear a bit of it. Can we make it a bit quieter? Wait a second. No. Wrong direction. <laughs> well, sounds nice. But yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, ah, now you have to watch this little screen while I do all my talk. <laughs> or we just watch it again. It's so, nice. <laughs> so, in it, you follow the story of a given family. Um, we call them pink, yellow, and lilac. Um, um, and uh, as in reality, gibbons live in, in small family groups, um, they live in the tunnels of Southeast Asia. Watch this. Some microphone. Okay. Um, um, where is this? Ah, no. Where is it? My computer? I don't know. Should I keep talking? Okay, now I keep talking. Now it works. Maybe it was Stefano's microphone. I think it was your microphone making noises. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, so um, gibbons need an untouched primary forest. Um, they almost never touch the ground when they live in there. Uh, they're very important for the ecosystem because their seed disper disperses. Um, they distribute about 100,000 seeds per year. So they eat fruit and then they ship the seeds out. Um, and about 10% of them grow into plants. Um, in our game, the main given you play with is called Pink, and it's a young adult that starts exploring the world uh, beyond the, its family tree. Um, Gibbons are the fastest and most agile um, of all tree-dwelling, non-flying animals. Um, although they almost fly, they can leap up to 50 meters from tree to tree and uh, reach speeds up to 50 kilometers per hour. <laughs> So they're really great uh, creatures. And this elegant and agile way of moving through the jungle is what inspired me to make uh, a game about them, um, because it's just so beautiful. Um, and while it's inspired by gibbons, it isn't a simulation. So um, while their main skill is recreation, they can also slide, as you've seen before, or they can be thrown by yellow, um, and they can also swing on vines, and even do somersaults, or speed boosts. Um, so we do, we are inspired by something like endless games, um, or also like skate or snowboarding games. Um, but it's really all about empowering the player, and to give them the feeling of how cool would it be to swing like a given through the channel. Um, yeah, and in given, you also build a relationship to yellow. That's your given guardian. Yellow helps uh, pink in the game um, in delicate situations like this. But maybe more important even is that uh, they also empower pink to, de to do even faster and cooler moves through the channel. Like you've already seen before, they're able to throw pink in midair. This is actually still my favorite move of the game. And I've been playing this for a lot for the last three years. <laughs> or more, and I'm still, I, it's still magic for me whenever it happens. I actually thought this will never be possible, um, but our great uh, programmer, Eddie Boxerman from <coughs> Canada, he used to make a game called Osmos back in 2010 on iPhone. It's a masterpiece, I think you should play it. 
Anyway, he's a great programmer and he made this possible. And he, he, he co-designed the movement uh, system with me. Well, anyway, so given, so, so yellow uh, brings in uh, even more, makes the playground of the channel even cooler and more interesting. So there, there is really a relationship built through gameplay between the two villains. Um, ultimately, though, you, you meet human influence uh, on the channel. Um, and with that, we are starting to tell a simple story about loss and reconciliation. Um, we're telling this without the use of words, so it's just through changing environment. Um, uh, as you're always moving from left to right, we can change the environment and you move to different areas. And there are small cutscenes in between to tell the story. Um, so, and that's also based in real life. So, once we started researching Gibbons, we found out that they're endangered and that their habitat is actively being destroyed by us humans, um, mostly to exploit the land for agricultural usage and mining. Um, and on top of that, they're also being hunted for illegal wildlife trade and being exploited for tourist photos. Um, so once we found out that about this, we knew we couldn't just make a pure escapist game, pure endless runner in an exotic jungle. So we really made this the second pillar of our game uh, to tell a story about habitat loss from the perspective of Gibbons, right? Because I think that's the power of video games is that we can put our players into the shoes of another uh, creature and talk to them about certain issues. Um, so yeah, our goal oh, has always been to touch players and um, to start thought processes, uh, to make them think about certain things, and even after they put down the controller, right? So even after um, they stop playing the game. Um, so sometimes they send us a picture of them crying after playing Gibbon, uh, which is a bit strange, but uh, kind of nice as well. Um, so I see game development as a communication tool. It's like, it's a one-way communication tool, obviously. I mean, yeah, we get a bit of feedback. <laughs> but um, it's, it's a tool for me to, to talk about topics that I find interesting, to start thought processes in people's minds all over the world in, uh, uh, with, uh, from diverse backgrounds. Um, um, so yeah, um, that's our goal. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about tools we use to do that. Um, one is uh, the special relationship between a player and a character. Uh, the main character, but also NPCs, or even the world, which I think sometimes might be the most important NPC in a game. Um, and I feel it's a special kind of empathy that players feel towards the game. I mean, they, they feel as the main character, right? They're not really the main character, but they feel as it. So I, I kind of like to call it empathy. Um, but yeah, let's take a step back from Gibbon, and a step back in time. Um, interesting, the games that I like or that I find most emotionally interesting or effective on me are games that have a very simple story. Um, stories that wouldn't be very interesting in other mediums. Um, and one I want to highlight uh, is, that's a game that was very influential to me and very important is Eco, and that's the trailer uh, in the back. And Eco's story is really very simple, right? Um, there's an outcast boy who gets put into a castle as a sacrifice because he has horns. Um, he escapes through luck um, and then meets a girl. He meets Yorda. Yorda um, and together they try to escape the castle. They find the minions of the bad queen, which might be the stepmother, um, and the castle itself. The castle is a very important character in that game, I think. Mm. Anyway, finally they escape with the girl, right? Um, and that's a very simple fairy tale story. It wouldn't be interesting if you just tell it to someone. Um, but when you play it in the game, the whole experience feels really emotionally important to you. It feels poignant and, uh, and it's a very, at least for me, it was a very uh, touching experience. Um, and the reason is because the game is more than just its story, right? It's the story is just a part of it. Um, and these simple stories become alive because you actually play in them. Um, this scene is uh, my favorite mechanic in Eco. It's holding hands with the order. 
And you do that by holding the shoulder button, I think. And as long as you hold the shoulder button, they hold hands. And I, I think this emphasizes this connection between players and characters again, because as a player, you're holding on, and as a, the character is holding on as well. And we actually have that in Gibbon as well. Uh, we, we, it was a struggle, but the way to implement it, uh, our movement system is that when you hold the button, the Gibbon holds on and keeps uh, swinging. Um, and if you release, the Gibbon releases and jumps. Um, and that was very important to me. I find it kind of like a poetic connection almost between you and the character. Um, it makes Gibbon a bit hard to get into. It's a bit of an inversion scheme. Anyway, so yeah, so there is this special bond uh, between player and main character. Um, and this also means that the players have a positive bias towards the main character. They're, they have certain expectations, um, expectations that they're the hero, for example, or that the actions they do will do good in the world. Um, and knowing that as a game designer, game developer, we can use that uh, in different ways. Um, in Secrets of Raticon, which was our third game, um, we used this to surprise our players. Um, maybe we also used it to shock them. Um, but uh, it, it was definitely a conscious decision. So, so Secrets of Raticon, you play as this uh, bird, peep, bird person. Um, it's a hoopoo, like in Ali's game. We, we saw a, a hoopoo already this morning. Um, and you play in this lush wilderness. It's inspired by the Alpine wilderness, because we're from Austria, so uh, that was an easy inspiration. But at, at some point, you find these strange machines, um, um, and uh, you, you feel that something's wrong, something's not really right. You even find animals in cages um, in this big, huge machine that you'll, you'll, you'll see now there. And obviously, as a player, if you get into there, you expect you will be the hero, and you're going to save those animals, and you're going to make nature beautiful again, and things like that. that um, the truth is that we kind of, well, we did the opposite, actually. Um, so, so yeah, these are the animals in cages that you see there. And now I'm going to spoil the ending of Raticon, because it's an old game, and you probably will never play it. So. I'll, I'll spy, spot it. Um, maybe you'll play it then. Um, so in the end, what we do is that uh, we actually make you kill the animals instead of freeing them. And what you also, I think, a lot of players realize at that moment is that by following a traditional game's progression, by following the rules and the expectations that you have to go into game, you were actually destroying most of this wilderness. You were ripping out trees, killing animals to get health and stuff like that. So the whole system is kind of designed in a way that if you follow the game's rules, you're actually uh, destroying this beauty that you want to protect. Um, yeah, so and, and in the end, you power this machine by killing the animals, and then you play a video game, uh, and that's the end of it. <laughs> I think uh, Raticon was is the most avant-garde game, probably the most edgy game we ever made. Um, it was definitely shocking for a lot of players because they expected it, uh, expected something different, and it was also off-putting. Uh, some people liked it. I met one yesterday. Uh, a lot of people didn't. Um, it was also not critically very well received. That has its reasons uh, for other different design reasons. I still like it because there's, I think we, we were, we're trying a lot of uh, new stuff with it and there are some things that are really nice, but it is a shocking game. Anyway, um, we, the next game we made is called Old Next Journey and for that we, while we were aware of this special link that players and characters have through empathy and we used it in Secrets of Raticon kind of as a negative way, if for Almost Journey, we wanted to use it to positively reinforce something. Um, and Almost Journey is a game about um, the balance between family life and visual, uh, individual fulfillment. Um, and it's again a very simple story. The old man has a family, but he still has his passion, which is um, sailing. Uh, and so at some point, he leaves his family to go on a sailing trip. Um, and then uh, when he returns to his family, his family is gone because obviously they wouldn't want to wait on him just because he's following his dreams and so they live their life without him and he's left alone. Um, and we told this story to people on the street by showing these pictures, just these 15 or, I don't know, 16 pictures. And the, most people's reaction was, was that, well, this old man is an asshole. 
He's a selfish asshole. And he kind of is, right? I mean, he, he made some wrong decisions, but life is more complex than that. And a lot of people know that, right? And that's, and what we wanted to achieve with Omen's journey is that people try to not follow their, their quick gut reaction of saying he's an asshole, but trying to understand why he made these decisions. Um, so we're using this, this positive bias that by, by having them play this old man and having them build a sympathy for them and a connection to this old man and having it set in a very beautiful world, they already build up empathy and sympathy for him. So once they encounter the bad decisions, they're more likely to think twice about it and try to see it from a different viewpoint. And we did the same with Gibbon. So Gibbon really is about raising awareness for the plight of Gibbons. It's actually the plight of all other endangered wildlife out there. Um, and we build up, uh, again, an empathy towards pink and towards the jungle um, because we really want the first 15 or 20 minutes you're just playing in this jungle and you're learning the system, the brachiation and the, and the gameplay and you're getting into it. And if you get into it, it's a lot of fun. And you're enjoying this, the jungle and the multiple layers and the variations as a great playground which um, builds a connection between you and the world as well as the gibbons. And then we take it all away. Um, so once you reach the destroyed channel, the parts that where humans have burned down the forest and cut down the forest, um, you lose something that was valuable of you. And I think this makes our players feel what is actually missing on a more direct level, on a more subtle, maybe more subconscious level. Um, so we're not, we don't have to tell them how sad it is that the jungle is gone, but we're showing them and making them feel it. And it's also more frustrating to play, it's harder to play because you can die in these fire pits. Um, and another example is uh, yellow. So we, we build up yellow as a help in the game. And at some point um, you reach this phase where you get hunted by poachers. Um, and yellow helps you um, escape them, um, but, uh, well, if you play well enough, you escape them, but still at the end, um, and I'm spoiling again, sorry, but at the end, yellow will be shot um, because the poachers want the given baby. That's what actually happens in real life. So to get a given baby that they can then use to sell or to sell to tourists um, for their Instagram photos, they have to shoot the whole family first. Um, so, uh, and that is sad on a narrative layer because yellow is being shot, but I think it hits our players even deeper because they also lose a satisfying skill in gameplay. They lose not just, it's not just, well, they lose something that they valued in gameplay as well. So that's how we use the link between characters between the main character and the player, but also the NPCs and the world. Um, another tool we use, and I'm gonna be a bit quicker, so I, I, I reach my time limit uh, on this, um, is something we call the emotional, emotional progression curve. It's, uh, it's more, it's more, it sounds more fancy than it is, actually. It's, it's just, it's basically a story arc and a level progression. Um, and we do, we do, we develop this in our concept phase. Uh, uh, so really early on in the, in the development. And what we do is we map the expected emotional response of our players over the progression of our main game. Well, it's not really true. What we actually do is we map the emotions of our main character, the emotion our main character feels uh, while during the story they live through. Um, but because as we believe that there's a link between story, uh, between player and main character, <coughs> We think that this link through empathy actually makes our players feel kind of the same. So we expect our audience to feel the same as our main character. And it's really simple. So there's uh, uh, the y-axis is positive and negative emotions. So it's really just positive and negative. It's simply, it's consciously simple, so it's easier to map. And we do add, <coughs> add check this, but well, I, I'll skip that. This is the emotional progression curve of Oldman's journey. And on the x-axis is the progression through a game. So this can be anything, it could be time. In our case, it's levels, um, because we have a very linear progression through a game, very linear story. Um, and basically, that's how we want our, our main character to feel at these moments and our players to feel. Um, we didn't invent this. I first saw it at that game company. This is the emotional curve of Flower, another great game. 
Um, and it's actually based on something called The Shapes of Stories by a novelist called Kurt Vonnegut. And you can look this up, it's really fun. He made the shapes of stories of different uh, parts, and it's, it's really great. Um, anyway, um, so we use this because video games are a multidisciplinary medium, right? We have visuals, audio, narrative, interaction. Um, and we want all of these to work together. And to do this, <coughs> we use this curve and we pass it to, 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 for all the team. We have this, I mean, it changes during development, obviously, but um, uh, we have this always there. And if someone is working on something, they know what to aim for, what's the emotional goal for it. And that's very helpful in an iterative development because we have someone doing the music before I, I, we know how it's gonna look like or play like. Um, a very, so that's a very handy tool. Um, yeah, uh, quickly another example was, uh, I wanted to bring up here is how all of this works together. So this is the palm of plantations, obviously visually it already shows the monotony of these plantations and the westness and it's like bad weather and the music is bad, right? But it's also the gameplay that helps enforce and emphasize this because it's actually boring to play. It's not super boring, we added these cables, um, but it is definitely more boring than the channel. And this boringness kind of emphasizes the vastness of these uh, plantations, which are really huge. You can look that up on satellite images, they're crazy huge. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm gonna stop, I think. Um, so just quickly, I mean, because of these aspects that I outlined before, I think video games are a great tool for making people care about the world, uh, about creatures and their habitat, and you can use it to put our players into the shoes of gibbons, I mean, they don't have shoes, but to make them view the world through that perspective. Um, it's especially easy if they're as cute as these gibbons, obviously. That's, I guess, why we always choose gibbons. But um, so yeah, I think a game can really help make a difference there and teach our players without you know too much raised finger education, too much being on a moral high ground, but really making them feel uh, the things that are actually not dystopias. It's the reality, sadly. Um, these habitats are really being destroyed. Um, with that, I'm gonna finish um, and. If there will be questions, we'll probably do it afterwards, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll make it up later. Yeah, okay. okay. So I'll pass the mic to Francesca. Pass the mic to Francesca, thank you very much. So, uh, but it's my best. So, uh, yeah, I'm Francesco Bertone, I'm game director of 2009 um, of Safe Studio. So, talking a bit about our studio, we are quite young. We started working together at the same school, and uh, Venice 2009 was the first uh, project we made at school. Um, at first, we didn't want to go uh, commercial or uh, to finish the game, but um, the reception was very good and uh, uh, we liked the, the concept. So we continued um, working on Venice 2009 uh, for three years until uh, uh, the release that happened uh, to be on October. Um, it's our first game and our first commercial title, but we, we want to make more games uh, Talking a bit, a bit about uh, um, the topics that we care uh, care about. So uh, let's watch uh, the trailer from Venice a bit, so we can so you can see what are we talking about. Uh, I think we have some audio. Uh, Volume is down there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my channel sound. Try again. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. That's good? Yes.
Okay, so um, what about Venice? Venice is a narrative explorative game set in a Venice uh, um, that's damaged by the high tide. Um, in Venice, you will um, you can run uh, with the old road through the city, uh, traveling from uh, one part of the city to another, uh, doing tricks uh, and uh, changing the music in a dynamic way depending on the tricks you, you take. Uh, you can you can also do quests uh, and uh, pick up stuff that is out of reach with your drone, uh, that is called uh, your tumble drone, uh, to solve some puzzles and uh, and do stuff. Um, you explore Venice at your own pace, uh, so it's not a, a one-way game. You can uh, explore whatever you want to go, and uh, it's a can achieve a game uh, to play. And talking about uh, uh, the main character, Nova. Uh, Nova is a young teenager uh, with uh, their own problems. Uh, they, they are a student that just want to chill out after the exams and uh, having a vacation uh, at Grandpa's house. Um, he's an apathetic teenager because uh, they like to judge everything that uh, is thrown uh, on her. Uh, but it's also curious uh, because uh, Nova mm, don't know uh, what to do in, in their life, so um, they just want to listen and explore and uh, find uh, their own way uh, to live their life. Um, so, in the background, Nova uh, meets a uh, kind of a dystopian uh, narrative. Uh, in fact, Venice uh, is uh, damaged by uh, climate change that already took place uh, in, in that time, and uh, the high water reaches half of the buildings ate with uh, all the issues that did this may cause. Uh, so the city is being uh, abandoned by the citizens. It is uh, like a ghost city, and. Uh, we, we choose the, this kind of uh, situation because 2019 is not so far from us. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite a, um, a period of time that we can see uh, us uh, in the future. Um, in fact, uh, when we first started our project in 2019, uh, 2019 sorry, um, climate change, uh, was an issue, but uh, two months after we started our um, prototype, uh, a huge, uh, um, a huge tide came in Venice. Uh, it, it, it set a new record uh, with uh, uh, of the this issue. Uh, so, uh, Venice Mirror uh, 2009 is a game uh, where we um, talk about uh, a climate change as that is already happening in the current uh, times. Uh, and uh, we ask the player, so what we, do we do now? So what we can do? In uh, Paris 2009, uh, it's a uh, thing that uh, it's a time uh, in the future that is not so far from us. It's not like a cyberpunk game where we can see a wholly different uh, uh, city um, in front of us. Um, we use uh, what we call uh, a future nostalgia because um, when you talk up with the characters or you explore the city, you can find references of the present uh, and the player can create a link between uh, the, the time uh, that Nova is, uh, is living with the time of the player. Uh, so this is happening, climate change is happening. What Nova could uh, possibly uh, answer? The answer of Nova is whatever, whatever. <laughs> uh, that's why, um, that's because um, we thought that we kind of like a, um, an anti-hero character that uh, is not supposed to save the world. Uh, probably because, because, because uh, uh, Nova uh, is born in a future where climate change already happened uh, and uh, need to be, yes, some, some we addressed, but uh, a lot of stuff has uh, already happened and has been lost. So, uh, 
from what we have, from what you can see in this world, we have uh, some uh, um, references, uh, quotes so that uh, we would like to um, take some information of uh, that uh, details the uh, emotions of Nova that are very, very, um, I don't know, apathetic or uh, very distant for a, um, I don't know, sensitive uh, kind of person. Uh, at first, uh, we think that Nova doesn't care a lot about uh, uh, Venice problem, but in a way, uh, she does. Uh, the, the fact is that Nova doesn't know what to do in their life uh, at all. So, uh, why should Nova care about uh, a problem that is so bigger than them? Than? So, uh, in the narrative, uh, Nova will find out that uh, uh, two people that um, that are both close to them, to them Clementine and Leo, uh, would like to uh, change the world uh, and save Venice from the disaster. Uh, Grandpa is uh, uh, an ecclesia and uh, uh, is like the diplomatic uh, pe uh, person. Uh, he wants to gather people uh, and uh, find a more pacific way to um, save Venice. Well, on the contrary, Leo is the, more like a, the, the right and the vandal one, uh, as uh, he wants to do uh, things um, his own way um, and acts alone. So uh, he doesn't want to um, get the, the help of nobody except from Nova. So Nova will find uh, themselves uh, between these uh, kind of people, uh, as uh, Nova would like to stay neutral. But following the both those uh, characters, um, it, it, the story will come to a conflict between uh, these two uh, point of views. Um, we like the, this kind of um, opposite uh, characters, uh, but we wanted also that the player could feel uh, a wider spectrum of possibilities of point of views. So we made the, during the production this compass uh, to kind of locate uh, uh, where the point of view of the other characters of Ben's present nine world uh, were. So, uh, for example, you can see there are more active characters that want to, uh, that, that do something to, to, to change uh, the, the situation. Uh, other characters that are more passive, other that are more pessimist, so they, they do stuff, but maybe uh, they, they just give up. And uh, some other characters are more optimistic. I will talk, I will talk a bit about uh, some of them. So, for example, Tiziano, the Ashok Turk, uh, he's not a nice person. He doesn't care too much about his customers. And, uh, he shot Luke, uh, Luke's abandonment because uh, Tiziano just gave up uh, and surrendered to the fact that he will have to uh, leave out soon. Uh, so he's the kind of people that uh, can keep up with the change and uh, stay where <laughs> he is, but uh, um, he knows he, he's going to leave out soon. Uh, Mm, very close to Tiziano, that's Rosetto, the baker, that is uh, mm, on the opposite, is a very lovely person. Uh, in fact, uh, Rosetta cares a lot of people, of men, so in fact, uh, I, know, I don't know, food is something that you can mm, give to um, with a lot of action, you know. Um, and it's a bit, a bit messy as a character. Um, uh, she to burn out the bread uh, very, very easy. Um, but he's too scared about moving out. So on the, mm, in contrast with uh, Tiziano, uh, she decides to barricade her bakery so she can be there in Venice uh, and uh, resist uh, the, the high tide. Um, another character that for me is very interesting is Anthony Priest. Uh, Anthony cares a lot about his church. Uh, but uh, he's, he's focusing on the, uh, on the wrong uh, uh, problem. Um, kind of, uh, he wants to uh, solve the bigger problem, solving first the, uh, the smallest problem. 
Um, for example, he's angry about uh, graffiti that someone uh, wrote uh, on the church, but uh, as Nova uh, says to, to Anthony, uh, the church has bigger problem than a small graffiti uh, on, the, on, the, on this facade. Other mm, more positive characters that want to change the situation are, for example, Min, that is uh, uh, he's not a nice citizen, and it's kind of st the stereotyped uh, character of the uh, Asian uh, tourist that will change uh, in uh, the report. So he's a character that comes from the, um, not from Venice, but knows a lot uh, about Venice and uh, is like a, a historical uh, reference to Nova and the player. Um, she wants to raise awareness about the problem, so uh, she's kind of like the, um, uh, who wants to solve the problem, uh, uh, speaking of the problem. Uh, Lucia uh, is the activist, and uh, she's a workaholic people, it's a touch nerd. Uh, she likes to stay in the archive, uh, trying to archive as much things as possible, and wants to save everything. But uh, we kind of think that it's a, a very over-optimistic way to see, uh, uh, solve the problem. Uh, can we save everything about Venice? So here the, um, the question changed then. What we can say about Venice or what we can should say about Venice? Uh, when we first uh, started developing Venice, uh, we uh, ask uh, ourselves uh, uh, what kind of Venice we want to represent in the game. Uh, so, um, of course, uh, we started with main monuments and say, okay, uh, main monuments have to be saved because they are part of the uh, world heritage. Uh, so we, um, in our narrative, uh, the uh, big corporations are taking away monuments uh, with the drones because, uh, of course, they are the uh, the heritage that, that can be also marketable, you know, <laughs> is the more uh, mm, important also economically for uh, for cities. But we uh, <coughs> didn't think that this was uh, uh, the only thing that we could uh, um, explore about this kind of uh, uh, dystopian uh, world. So we <coughs> thought that citizens could find solutions for themselves. Uh, as uh, Venetian uh, mentions, uh, uh, has done for for many years. <laughs> so uh, we uh, we thought that, for example, the platforms that Venetians uh, put on Venice when they are the high tide, uh, they could uh, they could be higher. <laughs> and uh, for example, like uh, Grandpa uh, does uh, to, to his house. Uh, um, he built uh, um, a room for Nova that uh, is up uh, over uh, his house. Um, yeah, so what is Venice? Uh, it's not only a main monument, it's not only uh, living in, in, uh, in Venice, but it's, only, it's also a, um, a huge city full of uh, architecture and uh, uh, multiple uh, inspirations, uh, references. Uh, as we um, dive them into the Venice production, uh, we, we, we had so many references about Venice that we had to make some choices to cut off, <laughs> cut more uh, 60% of them. Uh, so for example, you can see in this, uh, um, in this board uh, there are a lot of uh, windows uh, that we can find uh, in Venice. So uh, at this point we were, we were pretty, pretty much not done, uh, sorry, but um, we wanted to answer also the question of what is Venice for us, uh, us as a team, us as a person, uh, as people. Uh, so we also I decided to uh, take uh, those parts of Venice uh, that are not typical tourist uh, and uh, famous one. Uh, we took the, the part of the map of, Ven of, of Venice that uh, are more um, 
near to us uh, to uh, as uh, people that uh, like uh, for, exa for example me that studied in Venice and uh, uh, leave the city as a student or uh, as another um, kind of character. Uh, so we, we took some examples up in Ferdinand that are some areas that are not well uh, explored in, uh, in, in uh, this media. And uh, in the game we decided to uh, communicate this with the memories that are uh, some kind of souvenir, affective uh, souvenir that rep represents uh, the, the bond between Nova and uh, the character they met. Every character has a, uh, has a quest or more quests, and uh, every quest um, produces one memory that the player gets to, uh, gets to, to know it and to complete it. So, um, as a final note, I would like to spill some tea. <laughs> so, um, when we first put out the demo of Venice, uh, this, the reception was very good, but uh, this, this, there was some, this uh, particular um, review that says that climate change topics are not invasive for now as a uh, posit positive point on, uh, on, our, um, on our product. And uh, mm, this uh, may just reflect on the fact that maybe video games are always seen as uh, uh, something that uh, has, mm, don't, doesn't have to do anything with politics, with social impact, or, uh, and uh, player are, some kind of players are not so easy to accept. Um, <coughs> there was this test, <laughs> the slide. Um, in fact, uh, in our game, uh, mm, an, an interesting aspect of the game is that uh, uh, iType is uh, some kind of funny uh, mechanic uh, in the game, because uh, Nova can skate uh, uh, and uh, change uh, her, their path uh, throughout the city. Uh, on the other side, iType uh, for the Marvel of Venice is uh, a problem. Um, as well as in our present, uh, uh, I tell is something that uh, in, in for Venice is kind of sim a symbol, a, a touristic symbol of it. So that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, Venice 2029 uh, is out uh, from October, so you can find it on Steam and uh, Epic Store. And uh, that's all. <laughs> Okay, thank you both. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And before um, passing to other questions, I would like you both to discuss on one topic that which I'm interested in. I mean, uh, your your projects are in, in a way complementary. No? On on one hand, we have empathy, and on the other, we have um, I mean a sort of uh, call to action, or at least something that uh, in a way invites players to reflect on, on, on what's going on and on, on how we can act upon it. So uh, I was wondering, and I would like you to discuss on it, if the aspect of the other game are present in yours as well. Meaning, uh, is there a specific kind of call to action in your game as well, Felix? And is there a specific leveraging of empathy in Venice, uh, Francesco? This is what I was wondering. <laughs> Okay, should I start? Yeah. <laughs> Can I start? Um, it, there is a call uh, to action at the end of uh, uh, Gibbon. So at the end of the story mode, which is over in about 90 minutes, because uh, I like short games. <laughs> um, there we, so the story, although it has its really low point with uh, shooting of yellow, ends in a hopeful, positive way. And at that moment, we think that we've engaged our players, or we think that our players are most engaged. And that moment, we tell them about the real the reality or about that what they've uh, experienced is actually the reality and then we list a call, the NGOs. That's uh, what we do. Um, we've also just added an update which will go live on Arcade next week 
it includes an encyclopedia of facts uh, about Gibbons, so we learned and also again mentions the NGOs. We deliberately did not do any donations as part of the game. Like, you know, something like one dollar of the price goes to this NGO because we believe that this takes the resp responsibility away from our players. We think it might make our players um, lazy in the way that they're like, oh yeah, I already did something. I already played this game, one dollar that got donated. I I've already done good. So we deliberately did not do anything like this because we want our players to act on whatever means they have, uh, which might be different. Um, and also we want it to be their responsibility. So that's, uh, that's our call of correction. How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, the call to action, uh, as, uh, as I've said before, um, goes to NOVA, but uh, NOVA doesn't want to answer to that. Uh, and uh, in the same way, we felt like uh, we are, um, as a generation, uh, in, a, in a moment where there are a lot of responsibilities that are given to us, uh, that are demanded to us, uh, uh, even if we don't want to. Don't want it. So um, um, the game speaks about this difficulty to um, to accept that and uh, to um, find a way to uh, answer to these responsibilities. So uh, as the story progresses, uh, and not only that, uh, this conflict between uh, the call to action that Leo does and the call to action uh, that Grandpa does to to them. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a point of the game where you, you can see that Nova uh, seems mm, to not having uh, an answer yet, uh, and uh, maybe in the end of the game uh, uh, they will not have it uh, so clear. It's up to the player to decide uh, uh, if uh, Nova is doing good uh, or if uh, uh, the player wants to um, first to to be more closer to Grandpa, to Leo, to another character that we uh, try to uh, depict in our game. So the protection uh, of the game for the player, we don't want to uh, to have it so clearly, uh, because also it's a cheap game, I want to be a cheap game in a bespoken narrative. <laughs> well, and I think it's also, I haven't played tennis, but from what I saw, it feels like a lot of young people can probably sympathize with Nova, right? It feels like a character they that is close to the, to them, which probably is also easier for them than to think about these problems. Uh, because again, it's not like a moral high ground telling you what is wrong. It's and and also climate change hasn't really happened, but yeah, like it's a very likable character that I think players, especially young players, can probably feel very sympathetic to. Right? Yeah, maybe. Um Talking a bit about the name Safe Play Studio, uh, we found ourselves uh, working during the COVID, uh, everyone did, and uh, mm, there we experienced a lot of uh, team bonding uh, uh, on the Discord channel. <laughs> so uh, I think that also in Gibbons, the truth is uh, mm, the fact that the two Gibbons are uh, meeting each other, are helping each other to. Uh, throughout the game, um, I can see that um, being together and uh, uh, finding, finding an answer not only alone uh, uh, as a, an answer to our responsibility, but also uh, collectively uh, being present and helping each other is a good way to um, not having this responsibility so heavy on uh, our heads uh, and so heavy on uh, yeah, it's such a complex issue. It's crazy, right? So yeah. it's good to to soften it up a bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Grazie mille. Abbiamo domande dal pubblico. Is there any question? So first of all, thank you for very interesting presentations. Um, I have a couple of questions, especially for Felix, but. Uh, Francesco wants to chime in, I would be happy to. 
So, um, the first is when you said that uh, you received um, reviews of people crying for the games and stuff like that, and that mm, struck a chord because that something that happened to us also with a much smaller game. But um, that was a weird thing because you say, oh, okay, I'm very happy that I did something, but I actually hurt the persons that <laughs> experienced the game. So, like you touched, obviously, the topic of climate. So, uh, we know that climate anxiety is a real problem right now for all of us. So, the first is a kind of an ethical question, if you want. Uh, we like to treat serious topics between quotes, but they can be hurtful, it can be purposely hurtful toward the persons uh, playing the game. How do we do that with clear conscience? Are there other ways to talk about these topics that are effective the same way, but do not directly hurt uh, the persons uh, playing the game? Now, the thing is that um, there's an interesting um, thing in uh, uh, queer game studies uh, where we talk about empathy games, and there's a strong critique actually towards empathy games, which sounds counterintuitive because um, oftentimes it can happen that people play games that talk about experiences that are not their own, and then uh, somehow feel like, oh, okay, now I get this, this experience. And this often happened to queer authors and said, no, well, you, you are not getting it. You are seeing a slice of it, you can maybe intellectually understand it, a part of it, but that's not your experience, it will never be, and it's okay. Um, so, uh, this thing about looking the worldview through the eyes of is always something that is not actually happening. You're doing something else. And uh, um, so you, you said before an interesting thing, you said we don't want to make automatic donations because otherwise that uh, pushes the player to say, well, I've done my part, this dollar went to the charity, so I'm done. It would push toward a kind of passive allyship, which is actually not something we want. So I was wondering uh, if you also uh, give a thought about it and thought about ways to actually push players to act toward the problem and not feeling at the same time that they do understand it. like. They will never really understand what it means to be given in, in the environment that gets destroyed day by day. They can have a, a sensation of the problem, but it would be wrong for them to think they understand the full entirety of the problem for a non-human being. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, first question. So I don't, I, I don't have a bad feeling about getting people to cry about these things. I also don't think it's really hurting them. Like, I mean, they're hurt in the moment, but the feedback I always get from them is that it was a positive, still a positive thing, although they, they were crying, but it was, they were crying because they re realized that there's something that's really important about them and it, it touches them. Um, so in that sense, I see it as a positive, still as a positive, even if it's a strong emotional response, still as a positive emotional response. Um, also for Homeless Journey, I've seen streamers starting to cry at the end uh, of the game, but they've always, it was always framed at least as a positive thing, and always experienced it as a positive uh, reaction. Uh, positive in the sense that's, that it's a valuable, maybe valuable is the better word, valuable reaction to it. Um, so I think it's totally okay to get people to react emotionally strongly about these things. Be because these are, yeah, I mean, they're tough, complex problems, but it's really important to think about it. Um, the second, the, the question about whether it's okay to, if I frame it correctly, whether if it's okay to be to entitle yourself to say that you put someone else into the shoes of something and that you can actually experience it in, in that way. I agree that this is uh, obviously never 100% done. Um, and it's also a delicate subject. So in our past games, we've always been doing, getting inspiration for or talking about topics that are close to our own experience because we felt that, that that's something that we can talk about, right? So. Secrets of Raticon is about the Alpine wilderness and the destruction of this wilderness. And we are based in Austria, so we have a close connection or at least good experience of the Alpine. Obviously, we're not alpinists or, or biologists. Um, 
but still it felt like this is something I really know about, I can talk about. Oman's journey is about family and uh, individual fulfillment, which is a very personal topic for me. I have three kids and then I have a game company and it, that's actually what me and my colleagues really experienced is like, we have this game, com game company, something we, we are really passionate about, something we want to continue, but we also want to spend time with our family. So this was also a very personal topic I feel I can totally talk about because I, I know. And then it's said in the Mediterranean, I mean, we're not from Italy, <laughs> but we it's a very touristy view on the Mediterranean area, right? So it's inspired by Southern France, Spain, Spain, Spain Italy, um, but always stylized and abstracted. Um, but and as we were tourists in this area, we also felt this is something we can easily we, um, do. And now for Gibbon, we did not have that experience. So that, really, that was something we talked a lot about. Um, and our solution for this, which we felt why we're still able to talk about it, because we wanted to talk about it, is to talk to a lot of NGOs that are working. So originally we wanted to travel there, like, who, who, oh yeah, Ali was traveling to Iran this morning, right? Um, but our development schedule was tight and then COVID hit, so we had to skip the traveling. Instead, we talked to NGOs a lot um, during the process to four NGOs, people that are there. So we talked before when we had the concept phase, we got feedback, then we developed something, then we showed them what we developed, and then we uh, checked back. And then there's also something called culturalization experts. They're kind of like localization people, but they check for culturalization, how do you say, for stepping on someone's toes, possibility of stepping on someone's toes. Um, and we had that as well. And this was our checks which, which we felt okay to actually portray it in this way. And um, I mean, then the other fact is that we're portraying Gibbons, which is great because no human being will ever be like a Gibbon. So it's also easier to not, right? If I would make a game about uh, queer people, for example, and I'm not queer, then it might be more problematic in, in, in that sense, yeah. Long answer, sorry. Uh, but yeah, is is it uh, does that answer your questions? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, maybe um, regarding the first question, question, uh, I think that um, one thing that we try to do with Venice is to use Nova as a comedic character that um, can uh, also have irony and uh, joke about stuff that is very hard. So joking as a uh, like uh, um, our game. Uh, a uh, way to uh, push uh, the responsibility a bit far away. Not so far, because we, we are still talking about that, but, mm, mm, you know, give us uh, some air, give us some space. And uh, another thing about, uh, uh, you know, mm, we have Nova that is a, mm, is a real character, but we um, always mm, thought about uh, how can we mm. transport a mm, queer, uh, you know, um, story uh, in our game. Um, in the end, we look, we like to uh, keep her queer, but not uh, giving any explanation to um, give um, to let her have their own uh, experience. As you, as you said, uh, in queer studies, experiences are way are so bad. <laughs> There's a variety of non-binary experiences that is very, very, uh, very large. And uh, I think that mm, as, as, as we can, um, I don't know, mm, speak about, uh, mm, um, or try to, uh, yeah, to, to tell us a story, a specific story, and uh, mm, let, let, this, uh, let it out uh, and see what uh, uh, people, uh, after to that, even if, the, if, if this is not uh, um, it's not the answer we, we wanted, uh, maybe it's the start of a new conversation, a new game, a new story to, to tell. I just quickly want to add something <laughs> because something yeah. came into mind. Yeah, I, th I think it's really important that we also see games as an artistic um, product, right? And that we as um, game developers it's okay to, to also 
put in our gut feeling, our subjective view on the world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To quote Kendrick Lamar, I can't please everybody. Um, you will never be able to please everybody. Um, so it's also, I think it's also important to not hold back everything. I mean, it's important to be respectful about it, but it's also important to be yourself in, in your games. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Interrompo le domande, fate un applauso a Teresa Francesca.